uh, welcome to all of you. Um, it's a great pleasure to uh, be able to uh, find you. I, I just see you as a string of names, but um, I, uh, if you don't mind, you can just uh, switch yourselves on, then I, I'll see you as well so as, a, as a group, but um, otherwise we just, um, you know, um, we communicate as we can. Um, after all, this is a Zoom. This is um, uh, something that is uh, um, as close as you can get to a conversation between the International Space Station and um, Earth. So this is the um, planet SOAS, which is um, welcoming you. And uh, we have a, a number of um, uh, topics to talk through today, but for, I mean, the concrete um, uh, things which um, you may or may not be um, uh, interested in, but uh, importantly, I'm going to tell you what we can offer you here at SOAS. And uh, um, this is, of course, a, um, um, I don't know whether, can you see the large version or the small version, the version with the, um, which only has a, a sign or, uh, I mean, the picture or also the margin here. Which one do you see? You're meant to see the large one. Maybe I need to do it differently. Mm. Yeah. Um. No. <laughs> oh. I close it and then I open it again. So it's the um, this I take over here. We are technologically so advanced. Um, we are masters of this art. Try again. No. Uh, okay. So this is um, going to take us to a screen which you can see in large and you don't want to see me. No. Okay. So now you should be able to see um, the um, the screen as a large, uh, enlarged version, and you can see this fantastically crafted um, uh, welcome sign, which uh, my colleague Roy Fischel has, um, who's um, was the convener of the BA program here at SOAS in history, and uh, whose details you can see down here. So the his name and also the email address, and the email address has his initials and a number, because we like numbering things here at SOAS. Um, as a student, you will only get the number. That's very nice as well. So um, uh, we want to not persuade you to study history at SOAS, uh, but we'll just explain to you what uh, so, uh, studying history is like at a college, which is quite um, unique. And you can see this uniqueness uh, already on the, the welcome page, um, because for a, a university, for a college as part of London University, uh, which um, is almost exclusively focused on Asia and Africa, um, there is really no equipment anywhere in um, neither in Britain nor in, well, in Europe, you have two or three places which are quite similar. Um, in the wider world, you have a, a few faculties which uh, do something similar, but uh, it's a small, relatively small circle of colleges which uh, fulfill this function. Um, we uh, have a history which goes back uh, to the time when uh, this bronze was probably either stolen or bought too cheaply and ended up in uh, museums where they were then admired by the colonial populations of um, the populations of the colonial motherlands in uh, in uh, Britain or France or Belgium or, um, or the Netherlands. And um, so you have a um, link with the colonial past and SOAS, which is quite important because it is actually, I mean, talking about decolonization, um, SOAS is the place where the colonial um, administrators for the British Empire were being, um, uh, were being trained in the languages in the um, cultural background, in the um, histories of the places which they were meant to administer on behalf of Her Britannic Majesty. And um, this takes you to um, Africa. It takes you to China, where the colonization project did not really work, but in neighboring 
uh, areas, well, through the treaty port system in a way. Um, in neighboring areas, definitely. South uh, Asian continent has a number of uh, uh, places where the colonial era left a direct imprint, but this one actually takes you to an, another empire which uh, was existed before Mughal Empire. So you have a whole range of uh, um, uh, areas which are which were being taught at so as as a colonial institution and which are being taught now as a very decolonized institution. And the decolonizing exercise is something that we since I joined SOAS have been taken very seriously because um, uh, the essential difference between us and most other universities teaching India, for example, is that we uh, place the emphasis on uh, the, uh, well, the indigenous agency. So you, we look at the populations, at the uh, states, the empires that existed um, independently of the British Empire. If you study um, India at any of our other colleges, um, you, you, you will usually do it through the prism of the uh, occupying, of the colonizing uh, force and use their literature, use their impressions and um, get a picture which is altogether very different. So this is uh, what uh, uh, we take pride in. And it is not out of ideological reasons because really out of professional ones and um, uh, academic um, reasonings. And uh, this puts the emphasis on indigenous languages, languages that are spoken by the indigenous populations of the places that we teach. Um, here at SOAS, that mainly means Asia in all its different expressions. You see here Middle East, South Asia, Southeastern Asia, Eastern Asia. Do we also teach uh, um, the languages of the um, um, Russian Far East? Um, uh, a little bit. Um, we teach a bit of Tunguzik um, in the shape of Manchu, so that is also that. But um, Mongol, Buryats you have here, so if you if you study uh, about Mongolia, you also know something about the south of uh, Russia, the Russian Federation. So that in the, in that sense. But importantly, we also in, uh, in include all of Africa. So that's um, the the all the parts of Africa that uh, you could subdivide the continent into. Um, and the interregional space, for example, the what you can call so often called misnomed as the Islamic world, but the world that had contacts from the very beginning of civilizations, Egyptian civilization, um, um, the, the uh, Indus Valley, Oxus, um, the, the uh, Fertile Crescent, all of that is interconnected from the very beginnings. Do we teach the very beginnings? Uh, well, we used to teach them for the time being, we're a bit weak on them, but um, they are always there, they're always in our mind. And the important thing is that um, you, you need to realize as a historian that everything is interconnected um, or everything is local history and people are not aware of the wider world, but still through trade, through conquest as well, through migration, you get a degree of um, assimilation, which is um, there from um, the very first uh, uh, evidence that exists of civilizations and that take us actually into the uh, sphere of um, archaeology. Do we teach um, Europe? Um, usually we say no, but we do, because Europe is enmeshed into the um, uh, histories of Africa and Asia from, again, the very, very beginning. And uh, the more you study Europe, you actually realize, uh, especially Europe's early history, is that it's very marginal. It's, um, it's a, um, a non-entity. It's uh, something that also develops, but uh, at a much slower pace and uh, differently from uh, the high civilizations that we um, uh, th that we teach here at SOA, so the, the Indian civilizations, uh, uh, Eastern Asian ones, China, um, and um, Africa, you know, the uh, West African kingdoms um, outshone uh, what you could get in Europe easily. And the first major exception is the Roman Empire, but the Roman Empire also passes. And then what you get afterwards is fragmented and it's not very influential in any way. Um, 
but we do teach it. For example, in the uh, in the um, context of the um, Crusades, and Crusades are of course a um, a very controversial um, period in time. And the, the the reason why this is is because it is of they are often read against the background of the uh, the present. And um, we have a um, um, a fixation on uh, certain spaces, certain places. Um, let's call it the Holy Land. That's and the center of the Holy Land is uh, Jerusalem, and Jerusalem is very much the center of the of Christian Europe, both Catholic and the um, the Orthodox halves. And it's also the center of the beginning Islamic world. And of course, for Judaism, it is the center. It is uh, the, the, there's no other center than the center. So you have. The, these uh, overlapping uh, interpretations of the same space. And we're trying to get this across in our teaching. And whatever combination you end up with, um, if you study, if you're particularly interested in the Middle East, say, and you're studying uh, development studies, you're studying Israeli studies, you're studying, uh, you know, you can study uh, any of the languages that uh, is, is being spoken there, with history, then this plurality, plurality I can't speak, uh, comes through again and again. The same goes for the um, development of uh, Islam in the uh, Middle East, in the uh, areas where, where it established itself as the uh, predominant uh, religious and social order, and um, the um, uh, function in history co courses would always be uh, how is that connected to the reorganization of social life? What, what, do, what is the role between majorities and minorities? Uh, how do rulers, how do um, the um, uh, dynasties which are built on certain uh, religious principles, uh, how do they actually get across the um, uh, the fact that they are the rulers over a, um, I would say plurality, <laughs> plurality doesn't come out of my mouth, do they? <laughs> plurality of, of populations. How, how do they rule over multiple populations? Multiple, better. Um, so uh, this, is, um, th this is one of the um, uh, uh, phenomena that we can follow again and again through history. And the Mughal Empire, I mean, Roy can tell you much more about that, is, is a prime example. You know, you have Hindus, you have, um, you, you, you have Muslims, you have an expanding Muslim population. You also have other religious groups and they are uh, under the same rule. And at the same time, they begin to um, uh, extend into, a, um, into uh, areas where they were never at home, for example, in. Uh, into the center of uh, southern Russia, um, now a major majority uh, uh, religion. Um, what about China? China? Far away? Really? No. Uh, to say, I mean, this is a bit of hearsay, but you say the second oldest mosque in the world is building Guangzhou. Um, why? Because there were uh, trade connections that had established a, an Arabic-speaking, um, Aramaic-speaking, a population in uh, cities of southern China. And it's from there that Islam spreads almost simultaneously with the Middle East. So ma many things that you think you know, you have to unlearn in order to learn them new. This is no more so uh, true so for, than for uh, Central Asia. And of course, in Central Asia, you have uh, a variety of um, um, systems which are government systems which are either described as tribal uh, usually in the uh, colonial literature or uh, as uh, established states and um, uh, think of the kingdom of Af afghanistan and of course you have a king yes but there are also other entities and these entities are uh, very well established and they're very well ruled and the only re uh, reason that why you could call them as a refer to them as a uh, tribe is because um, there are certain principles which um, are which um, govern them, which uh, link the families together in a stronger way than state institutions do. And it's uh, th this is one of the things that we study, and we study them from 
the, the bottom up. So from using archives, using, um, uh, of course, translations of, uh, of primary sources that come from this time, we get a much better understanding, much more nuanced understanding of the, uh, uh, the, the way that populations relate to each other and that different cl classes and groups within these populations uh, do the same. So, and um, this is true for the, um, uh, for, for uh, civilizations at any level of development. And if you believe in different um, uh, levels of development, then uh, you can say from the primitive stage up to the most civilized stage. But of course, I would like you to empty your head and to think again, uh, just, you know, what does it mean to be civilized and so on. So this is an example from uh, uh, Hanoi. Um, this is not how people in Hanoi live, but it's um, it's an open air museum uh, which has a long house from a Hmong, Hmong area, so from a Miao area. Um, if you're um, a little bit at home in Southeast Asia, you will know that apart from the big dominating um, dominant um, populations, you have um, like the Han or the the, the King, so the, the Chinese and the uh, the Vietnamese. You get um, you get many, many minorities who together actually make a majority, but um, they, they are fragmented. And this is one of these uh, minorities. Um, this is another minority um, dressed up in uh, drag, yes, in very um, colorful clothes, um, a shaman, and it's a modern day shaman. Um, so these are probably uh, receptors for, for his mobile phone, but it's um, um, this is a, a, um, a shamanic dance that is being enacted in a skiing resort somewhere. <laughs> but it's um, a, a, um, a very um, a, a timely reminder that the northeastern um, Asian um, civilizations that they also go back to somebody else in the past. And we have here a this is a um, colonial era, but actually pre-colonial. It's a Western uh, document, which comes from uh, the time before um, any Europeans had established themselves in Eastern Asia, except for the Dutch, because the Dutch are there always before anybody else. And they um, are further down here in the Southeast, in um, Sumatra and Java. And then also they um, uh, extend over the Spice Islands. But um, um, the uh, important thing is that we have this map of Japan, Korea, and China, which actually, and Formosa, so in other words, uh, China, uh, Taiwan during a time when it is uh, not yet really part of the province of Fujian, that comes later. Um, so, um, and you get this idea that this is all very closely connected. And here you think of Baudel, Baudel who writes about the Mediterranean as a sea that connects. So in other words, not a sea that separates, but a sea that forms a bridge. And this bridge is made of water. And uh, all the people here in Nagasaki who communicate very clear, closely with uh, their counterparts, merchants in the south of Korea, who then uh, uh, communicate with the areas in Shandong that, uh, that, that you get um, uh, developed as part of the Chinese empire. You can see how closely this is related. Earlier on, I showed you a Manchu. This is um, a Manchu script here, Dai Qing Duka. This is the gate of the, the, the great Qing, Da uh, Qingmen. So this is uh, from uh, Shenyang, Shenyang, the second capital of the, uh, uh, the, the, the Qing Empire. Um, uh, did you know that it had two capitals? Uh, most people don't. Um, it's um, the uh, significance of this is that um, uh, the Manchus had a certain role to play. Uh, namely that of providing the dynasty, but that this did not mean that they were uh, occupiers who um, colonized um, China. So this, or in through China, other people. So this is again, something you have to unlearn. Um, now you have Xinjiang in the news. Um, fantastic session yesterday with my MA class about uh, uh, the, the uh, Galdan campaigns. Um, you know, there is so much, there, there, there is uh, simplification and there is, there is uh, there's of course truth in everything, but um, uh, the whole story about how uh, the Qing empire formed its borders um, is, um, is, is much more complicated than, um, uh, than comes out in Wikipedia pages. So we try to give you the view from different angles and then especially 
from the original documents that you find from the time, both in, you know, in this case, in, uh, in uh, Qing languages and Qing sources, the Chinese, um, Mong Mongolian, Manchu, we, we provide them for you, we, get, we translate them. Um, and then, um, uh, of course, also later, you would use uh, Uyghur in uh, Arabic script. Um, you can have that here. That's, uh, there, there is a, um, uh, and then also the Europeans count, yes. Americans even that, uh, even, even Americans count, but, but Europeans count, yes, because they send visitors, they send travelers, they send uh, consuls, and th these people create their own, um, their own records. And we, we put them side by side with the, um, uh, with the, the ones that we encounter. Uh, Zheng He, again, takes us to Africa. Africa, do we have accounts about uh, China and Africa? We do, yes. And it's um, uh, we uh, and vice versa. So we have um, a um, a number of um, uh, really interesting um, accounts that I have sitting here on my uh, um, on my bookshelf from early journeys from Eastern Asia into Africa and um, uh, and um, with depictions of giraffes and so on. So this is um, a um, uh, something that you certainly um, uh, can study here if you're interested and how. You study these things here, yeah, Myanmar, Rohingya. Huh? Just read this morning that there was plenty of traffic between um, Burma and India. Refugees, actually not Rohingyas in this case, they were um, they were people of the um, a minority crossing over. Um, th this is something that you can learn here at SOAS, Africa, from every angle, especially from the angle of communities that have. Um, that are multilingual because they are minorities within areas that are uh, governed or dominated by other groups. So this is, uh, it shows you, this is Congo within all its uh, uh, expression um, and they publish in languages as well. So uh, if you have a reason to study here at SOAS, and this is when I'm at the point now where I'm going to hand over to, uh, to Roy in a second, um, uh, do come here if you have an interest in uh, finding out the histories of the populations in their original uh, uh, languages and also in their original um, interpretations, namely that of the states that they form and the archives that they collect. Um, and if it's oral history, if it's non-written languages, that can also be explored. So be imaginative. We will help you with that. Um, if you're a slightly older student, you're, you'll be feeling very happy here at SOAS because uh, we have a high proportion of mature uh, students. Again, if you're not from England or if your parents are not from England, you'll feel like a fish in water. Uh, uh, and then also the library, which is the last thing that I refer to. Um, um, it's uh, one of the most complete collections of non Western um, holdings, non-Western uh, origins. Um, so China, Africa, um, sorry, Asia, Africa, and, um, uh, and quite, quite a number of uh, uh, languages that you wouldn't expect here. Um, we have them, and we have them because this is one of the um, uh, libraries that are receive a grant from the British government, have been receiving a grant for forever uh, in order to keep a complete collection over the world for the British Empire, later for the spies who were being trained here at SOAS and um, in the Cold War, and today for you who are going to be studying here at SOAS because uh, you are the future and you deserve the best and we will give you the best both in our library and our, in our teaching. And Roy will tell you now how we teach here at SOAS. Um, thank you, Lars, and I'll ask you when to uh, change slides for me, please. Okay, okay. <laughs> um, so after the very exciting presentation of Lars, we'll have to get a little bit more, more to the boring bit of structure of programs, although quite important, I would say. Less inspired, maybe, though. Uh, although before that, I just want a quick addition to uh, something that Lars said about the depiction, Chinese depiction of giraffes. Interestingly enough, we have from 
late 15th century, a temple in South India with uh, giraffes engraved on it. Uh, it's, it's, not, it's not a temple, it's actually a performative uh, platform. So it's something aimed at display to the people. And this is part of those kind of trans Indian Ocean links that connected East Africa with India, with Southeast Asia and later um, China. So how are we going to approach this massive part of the world that we are covering? We are covering about 80%, 75% of the human race at SOAS is our emphasis and not as the periphery. And this is one of the things that make us so unique. Um, I'm going to present briefly the BA history as a single subject. And later I'll make a few comments about a BA history as a joint degree with another program. Uh, we have a few, quite a few students on each uh, track and just for you to have a basic idea. So, our idea here is to introduce you into, first of all, history as a discipline, as a method and a way to investigate the past. It can be a remote past, it can be very recent past, but as a discipline, analytical discipline that gives you these wonderful tools of analysis and then of argumentation. And in that sense, history is really a terrific degree to have helps you develop these kind of uh, aspects which are not only great for you uh, for your future as people but also more particularly uh, for the job market um, for example and that's one of the interesting connections that we have we have quite a few students who go on afterwards to do law and they say afterwards that the skills that they learned in history especially around evidence, argumentation, presenting their ideas in a very clear way, came in handy. So we are going to cover this kind of methodological um, um, aspects of the discipline. In addition, we will give you tools to investigate uh, everything that you will learn within broader global context, either by putting them in actual global history or, or, or in addition, in, in the following years uh, also by presenting themes that you can apply to different parts of the world and then the focus that you choose from from a selection of modules about which regions you want to look at with i think the best strategy is always to take different modules from the covering different regions of the world because the approaches, the ways that questions were asked and uh, discussed was significantly different in different parts of the world. And to give this a, a huge variety of approaches only helps you to develop your own intellectual skills as people. So according to those three main objectives of the degree, we have constructed the three years. The first year, you will have two core modules in term one, uh, approaching history that uh, both Lars and myself are teaching this year, uh, in which we exactly start thinking about what is history as a discipline and how different it is from anything that you may have learned at A-levels or in whatever school setting that you have. So taking away from the list of dynasties, and something very rigid in, rigid in terms of the way that you articulate the answers to allow you develop your own flexible approach and to understand the depth and the uh, complexity of this wonderful, wonderful discipline. Of course, I will say it's wonderful because I cho uh, chose to do this for my life, my livelihood, hopefully until retirement, but I do think that we can agree, generally speaking, that history is very interesting. I guess that otherwise you wouldn't have been here with us today. The second term of the same core aspect, we are looking in particular at the question of colonial historiography in relation to SOAS as an institution. So taking SOAS as a case study, we look at the way that 
history is related to the environment in which it is written. So we are looking at SOAS as an institution that started as training civil servants for colonial purposes and changed tremendously since. It was the first institution that actually taught seriously uh, African languages in the West. It was one of the first places in which the a non-theological approach to languages like Arabic or Hebrew was, um, was, was practiced. So we have our own complex history as a very interesting tool to start thinking about how history has been written and how much it represents the presence, the various presence in which history was written and not only the past. So this covers this kind of methodological aspect. In addition, you will learn world history, which is a very SOAS version of global history, very much in continuation of what Lars presented earlier. It's trying to understand the world not as a product of European kind of project of thinking, but a much more complex system in which Asian and African societies and civilization played a huge role. And then the Europeans arrived at one point. And even when the, the European arrived, it's not as if the whole world changed to become European dominated realms in which Africa and Asia are completely mute, not at all. So for us, if we look at the British Empire, it's the empire as was perceived not only in the government offices in Whitehall in London, but also the way it was experienced in places like Lagos or Cape Town or Nairobi or Bombay, or even in places that were not directly ruled by the British Empire, like let's say Shanghai, right? So we have our own take of global uh, history in which Europe is considered, but in its right place as kind of the less fashionable parts of Eurasia, very damp, very, uh, I mean, I'm looking outside the window now and seeing this gray cloud, not the most fun part of Eurasia, I have to say. Then you can select from regional introductions. So we will look at the list of modules say, uh, in a bit. Then you have the option to take other regional introductions, open options from another module, if, sorry, from another program, if you are interested, or, and we highly recommend, one of the wonderful selection of languages taught at the SOAS from Chinese eh, or Arabic or Japanese to Yoruba or Zulu. So we have a really unique selection of, eh, of, of languages. Second year, we have the same logic eh, behind it, but it's slightly different. You will continue eh, with historical research and the, the methodological aspect to which will be attached a first attempt of yours to create a research program, a, a project, um, not a very small one, but not yet fully independent. In terms of the global perspectives, here we will focus on themes, thematic modules. We will see the list in a second. And then more regional, more specific focus module. And then you can continue with the language or open option or other modules from our program. The third year, uh, you have the special subject as your core, which is an, an interesting combination. There is a lot of focusing on uh, particular cases, but again, as part of training for you to write your independent research. And this is, I think, the crowning, uh, or the, crown, the, 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 the jewel in the crown of your degree is writing your own dissertation. An independent study, 10,000 words, the results that we have seen in previous years are remarkable. Really, our students write such wonderfully original and in-depth studies of the, the program. And then you have a few more modules to choose from. Lars, will you please? So another way to look at it uh, is broken, the first year in particular, broken to the core, which is the more methodological aspect, the world, the, the way with we look at global approaches, and then the regional options. 
that you can see, I think that we have a, a list later. So please continue, Lars. Um, BA history end is, of course, half of the aspect that you need to, to more or less half in history and half in the other program. It's a bit more flexible. When it is relevant, we can discuss it more, which includes the core modules, because you'll have to deal with the discipline. And then you can look at either the global or regional introduction, the methodological a historical research in second year, again, to continue with the disciplinary aspects and the, the methodological aspect, and then both thematic and regional uh, focused. And you'll have to take the special subject as a core, but then you have the option whether to write a dissertation with us or not. Lars, please continue. Another way to present exactly the same uh, a table for the first year, so the core and that, yeah, and continue large. So this is the selection of regional introductions that you have. This is, we cannot guarantee what is going to uh, run next year yet, but by and large, it gives you a good idea of what is on offer here. So term one, you can choose from the introduction to history of Africa, the Confucian world, which is a, early history of East and Southeast Asia, and the introduction of the early history of the Middle East. The second term, we have the history of the middle, modern Middle East in the world, so it's Middle East in the modern world. Uh, again, you see that we are doing it in a very soft way of not only looking at the region, but to understand how the work functions in a global context. Then we have the option of the history of South Asia, which is my own field, and the introduction of the history uh, to the history of modern East and Southeast Asia, which is taught by large this year, right? Yeah. Can you continue? Uh, for the second year, we talked about the, the historical res the research methods and the project attached to it, and then the thematic and the regional modules. Uh, large, please continue. Uh, here is a good example of what we are teaching. Again, we cannot promise at this point that all of them will run when you are students, but it just to give you a taste of what kind of modules. Some of them run uh, in uh, alternating years. So my own modules, um, which is the state and society in Mughal India and empire and globalization in the early modern Muslim world run one each year. So if you are really interested in that, you can catch theoretically, if this continues the pattern, one of them in your second year and the other in your third year. The same with um, uh, colonialism and culture in modern South Asia and uh, nationalism and identity in South Asia. So there are separate modules that run in alternating years. So I mentioned the thematic modules. For now, we, we define the, those four as uh, important themes that might interest you. It's cities, uh, frontiers, gender, and violence. Again, as categories of historical investigation that manifested themselves in different ways in different contexts. So it's giving you the tools to take those uh, ideas and implement them on the parts of the world that you are interested in. And the regional modules, uh, you see great selection, modern South Asia, a, a, a empire and reform in the modern Middle East, the really 20th century Middle East. We have a couple of on, on Asia, Mao's China, and, and from courtesan and suffragists, women in Chinese history. And we have the Africa modules, Atlantic slavery, uh, and the Muslim societies in Africa, hopefully to be revived soon, but cannot promise that. Uh, so this is the kind of things that you will select from. Now you can continue, Lars. Uh, the third year, as I said, you write one dissertation if you are single subject. If you are joint degree, you can write a dissertation in history, but not necessarily so. It depends if you will write dissertation uh, if you choose to. It depends on the program you're in. I, I cannot cover all programs now, only the history side, but you are most welcome to write dissertation with us in history if you are interested in. 
and you will have to take one of the special subjects that combine specific themes, but with uh, methodological uh, issues and help you develop your research skills. And those currently include the partition of the Indian subcontinent, uh, the late Ottoman Empire, a South African apartheid, and Larsh's own opium and empires. Please continue. And just very, very quick reference that we have very interesting resources here. You have the, we have the history blog. I really recommend you to take a look. It's wonderful, wonderful, all run by students. And you are most welcome to write for that as students. It's a really good platform to ex experiment in writing for audiences. So it's terrific. We have our own library, including tutorials. You will be introduced to it as part of the course, but also you are most welcome uh, to take one of their tours. Um, and the, the, the handbook and uh, degree regulations, if you, if you are really curious about the technicalities at this stage. And the last bit, we are in London. Not only London, we are very much in central London, which means that you have unparalleled resources as students. It's just unbelievable the richness of it. Within walking distance, we have the best libraries. Uh, probably we have the best library collection in the world. So we have the British Library, the second largest collection of all libraries in the world after the Library of Congress, I think which is the, the, the American equivalent for the British Library. It is about 13 minutes walk from SOAS. As students, you can get easily access to their collections. You have access to collections of all other University of London colleges. So if you're interested in economic history, you can go to LSE. If you need, or London School of Economics. If you need a, for, for some study, a more European-centered so, uh, resources that we happen not to have at SOAS. You can go to Senate House Library, which is literally three minutes from SOAS, or to our neighboring colleges like UCL. You can have access to all of this. And we have the museums and we have everything because London in that sense is amazing. I think that I'll finish here. And I guess that now it's time for questions from the audience to Lars or to myself. Thank you. Oh, and yeah, if you go back to the beginning slide, that if you have questions, you are most welcome to email me as the program convener. I'll be very happy to continue any kind of conversation you're interested in. This is my email address, rf26 at SOAS. Any questions that you may ask, or you can use the chat box. Daniel? Daniel yeah, hi. Yeah, hi. Um, uh, I'm a student in Basta. This is just to uh, everyone. But um, if you have any questions about uh, what it's like to take, uh, to take um, history as so as, uh, I can help you with that. I'm a second year student doing um, history and international relations. So any questions? And Daniel, yeah, I, I saw your name. I wondered what you were doing. Here. Yes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it looked a bit too familiar. Yeah. Oh, that's actually another thing that is worth mentioning is that we are a smaller program than, let's say, King's or UCL or Queen Mary. And there is one advantage that many students don't think about it. And Daniel, I really hope that you feel the same <laughs> about yeah. that, that we are very accessible. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. We talk to our students, we encourage our students to talk to us and not to teaching assistants, but to us, the full academic staff. Yeah, and, and we really try to develop this kind of relationship that I think that it's wonderful for us, for sure. I think that it's pretty good for students. You, you never feel that you are alone, or at least you have so many ways to make sure that you are not alone in this, in your degree. You have quite a lot of support from us. Yeah. Um, Lars, will you take Ubaid's question? 
Yes. I can't see any questions. But, oh, uh, yeah, in the chat box. So Baid is asking, ah, what are the entry uh, requirements? Uh, if I share this, then it's, I can't. Oh, actually, one second. Maybe I can. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Uh, do you do any year abroad? What are the entry requirements for history? Entry yeah. requirements, well, uh, it depends on the, um, depends on the year, what the so-called tariff is, uh, where it is set. But um, at the moment, it's quite high. So you in A level terms uh, A A B so uh, uh, that's the um, but, but there's some flexibility so but uh, uh, we have a uh, almost a higher expectation from you in terms of um, uh, preparedness to um, show that you're interested in um, in the world world of history in this case that does not mean that you actually have to have studied history at at uh, at college, so it's uh, at university, at what is called school, yes, uh, at school. Uh, there we have many students who, um, uh, for, for example, I did the uh, straw poll at the beginning of our introductory course, H101, and um, how many of you have studied uh, history? Uh, uh, roughly half. So um, uh, th that's uh, not a requirement. So if you're not studying history now, uh, you can still join us as, as students. And then uh, what we would like you to do is to consider uh, studying, um, uh, you know, an interest in languages always helps um, when it comes to selecting students. And uh, if you have a, a language that you not necessarily have in your uh, school reports, for example, because your parents speak Bengali at home or, uh, or an African language, then by all means mention that in your um, in the covering letter that we get, because th that that is something that will make us, um, you know, look again at your application. Um, okay, uh, shall I continue with the following yeah. questions? Yeah. So, uh, do you do uh, any year abroad? Um, yes and no. The history program at this moment, and I emphasizing in this moment, does not have a year abroad except for a few people who can apply to Erasmus programs, but we don't know where it stands after pre uh, Brexit yet. Yes. But first of all, and I had a conversation in the previous, the in-person uh, uh, open day about that with uh, some of my colleagues uh, higher up, and we are now working on enabling it. So we cannot promise that it is going to happen but we hope that it will be introduced. At the same time, if you are doing a joint program with one of the languages, then you do have a year abroad. So we do have year abroad for the languages. Mm -hmm. So people who do, let's say it's kind of popular these days is to do history in Korean. Korean became extremely popular even before the Squid Games. <laughs> uh, I suspect that it's K-pop, the popularity of K-pop or generally speaking popular culture from Korean that encourage many people to learn this uh, this language which is always a wonderful reason i think um, then it's a four degree uh, program with a year in korea mm -hmm. now a uh, history and international relations is one of the most popular um combinations so it's a very well a uh, uh, well-trodden path let's say um there is a I, system there is a system for that i think that it's a good combination history and ir is very good because it really gives this depth to your ir interest that the program itself ir itself will not have yes just to add on uh oh yeah as, please uh yeah because uh uh i'm doing history and international relations but um a lot of uh the content and in international relations, it intertwines with uh, content from history. So, for example, in the first year, we look at um, global history and uh, trends and themes uh, throughout uh, history, basically. And uh, so a lot of it, uh, like, interlinks and uh, it's quite enjoyable. Overall. Great. No, thanks, you, Danielle. That's the experience of student is always way more valuable than ours, I guess, because we can imagine what we are giving, but it might be received in a different, that's a very important yeah. lesson for history, for generally speaking, dealing with history, 
is that when we look at sources, we assume that what is written there is how the source was received, but those are completely different mm -hmm. things. Yeah. Um, how many hours a week is timetable, uh, asks uh, Marlin. Uh, for non-language degrees is eight hours a week usually. If you add language, usually it's many more hours because languages tend to, to occupy more hours exactly because of the particular kind of practice you need. But generally speaking, a module is two hours contacts a week, plus all the work that you need to do. There, there you'll see a very big shift in the way that you do, um, the, the way that school is constructed and university is constructed. That, this is not a SOAS thing, that's a university thing, is that there is much more emphasis on how you learn on your own. So we give you tools, but this work is not us feeding you, but we help you develop your skills to do it, to, 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 to study yourselves. Uh, Lars, will you continue with Ubaid, maybe? Yes, so th this is, um, I saw that question and I, <laughs> I th th the official entry requirements, they will be fine-tuned always when it comes close to admissions. And uh, I mean, the um, UCAS um, uh, procedure when uh, admissions decide who, who, who will get an offer. Um, it sometimes happens. And there's discussions in that direction, certainly going on at the moment, that, um, that the general, um, the official entry requirements will be lowered. But I, I, can't, I can't promise anything and I can't see anything actually in the uh, um, uh, correspondence that I've received and the uh, gossip that I've participated in, uh, that this would be happening soon. So we, we need to see where we are and also, um, also in the worst case, if you don't get the grade that you're, uh, that, that you're out for, you, that you can reapply. There's the, um, you, you just go through the clearing process and then, and then, you, can, then you can write, you know, uh, my uh, grades were lower than expected, but I'm very keen and I, I, I have, uh, you know, uh, lived for five years in uh, Western Africa and I would like to pursue this, um, you know, we are, uh, not robots, so uh, we we do uh, let people in even if the grades are not a hundred percent there. So uh, uh, yeah. it's um, I, again we we have to see. Yeah, uh, we we will need to wrap up in like a couple of minutes. So let's oh. get the following questions very quickly. Yes. Oh, just uh, to <laughs> add to large about requirement, uh, those with a uh, certain backgrounds. Uh, fall into what we call widening participations and their, their requirements from them are slightly different. So this is another way that it's uh, another thing that is worth um, uh, examining this option. Yeah. Uh, so as hold interviews for history for entry, no. Mm -hmm. uh, a dissertation, um, I don't know if uh, dissertation is required in history. If it is, you can choose whether it's IR or history. If it is not required in IR, you can choose to do a dissertation in history or not do a dissertation at all. It's your choice here. A and com combination of history of Japanese, yeah, it is a four year degree with one year abroad. So you do two years at SOAS according to our year one and two, a year abroad, and then the final year is a um, equivalent so it's fourth year of your Japanese but third year of history so there is a very clear path there I guess that we do need to finish here so right. thank you very much all of you and thank you Amani uh, for a uh, further information and questions please see the last message from Amani in the chat study uh, at and you are most welcome also to contact me directly for anything related to history in particular I just want to say thank you to Lars and for, um, to Roy for hosting this session. Um, like I said, if you do have any admissions questions, you can contact study at SAS, or if you have any history specific questions, you can contact Roy. Um, and yeah, just want to thank you all for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. You Enjoy your afternoon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm.